All right, well, let me introduce you a little bit for those that don't know okay. you. Um, Dr. Richardson, she's, uh, like Paul, uh, she was a PI for Vortex. She was also actually involved with Vortex One and the subsequent follow-on projects. But she was a, a principal investigator for Vortex Two, and also she was part of the Vortex Two steering committee. And uh, her background um, heavily with uh, radar data and radar uh, interpretation with the Dow data and so forth. So um, with that, Yvette, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I know that Paul went over a lot of uh, probably some of the theoretical underpinning, which is just perfect because I had to cut most of that out in order to shorten this. And I just wanted to show some some results from Vortex 2, some things that I've been looking at. Um, and I'm looking more at the maintenance and the demise uh, phase of the Goshen County, Wyoming tornado. Um, and so uh, Paul probably talked about the formation of the tornado. I don't know. I just came in at the end of his talk, but I assume that's what he, what he talked about. So I'm looking a little later on. And um, with lots of collaborators there. And all the pictures I'm showing actually were taken by your very own Al, Patrika. Um, so I'm very grateful to him for letting me have them for research purposes. And the motivation for this, uh, I think I heard Paul talk about this a little at the end of his talk, but really there haven't been very many studies of tornado maintenance or demise. Um, a few, the Alan Bluestein and Marquis et al. have touched on it. Um, we also, Jim Marquis and I, um, try to look at that in his PhD work, and mainly the influence of these small surges within the rear flank downdraft that um, we think have an impact on maintenance. Um, but Obviously, for all of us, I think it is important to understand what goes into maintaining a tornado and what makes some of them so short-lived and some so long-lived. And so we're just kind of starting to even think about this whole problem. It's not, not really been a lot um, previously. So just to go through one background example, um, and then I'll get into the Goshen stuff. Um, Dow and Bluestein did do this nice study of um, looking at a conceptual model for cyclic tornado genesis. And so if you look at these, um, these are the, this is tornado number one, and this is a new one starting here, number two. And then you can see that tornado one is moving along this path, while um, tornado two forms over here. And if you, if you look at these in terms of where these are relative to the updrafts, which are these dark shading, areas, um, you know, one starts out very, very nicely within this, within this updraft. Um, but according to their, their theory or the way that they looked at it, when the outflow was fairly weak, um, the, the relative balance in their terminology between the outflow and the inflow made it such that the tornado kind of moved backwards. Um, with respect to the the updraft, um, just one second. Uh, sorry about that. And back. Um, and so, so this was the way that they kind of looked at at tornado maintenance. Um, so I wanted to look at this in terms of the Goshen tornado, and this is uh, what our deployment looked like. So we have both of the Dows here, and they're making a dual Doppler lobe um, that looks over here toward the west. And after, um, after some time, then I switched to a different dual Doppler lobe between Dow 6 and NOXP, which looks more over here toward the east. Um, and the reason for that is that, as you can see by the red line where the tornado went, um, Dow 7 was not exactly able to stay there for the entire length of the tornado. So uh, at some point, they had, to, they had to kind of move out of there. 
and uh, we pick up his other dual Doppler lobe. But first I wanted to show single Doppler from Dow 6 because they have the, the longest deployment there and um, kind of cover the complete lifetime of the tornado. So this is what the single Doppler data look like. Um, and <clears throat> so let's see if we go back to the beginning here. Um, you can see the tornado start to form there, and then it, as it moves, um, one thing you notice is that there's, there's a lot of reflectivity that moves kind of down along the back of the hook here, and then ends up getting swept around the tornado. Um, it's really interesting, you know, spiraling rain curtains. And we're going to look at those in some more detail. Um, in the velocity over here, you can see the formation of the couplet and then maintenance, and then it really dies out there at the end. And that's captured here in the single Doppler data, just looking, whoops, just looking at delta V. Um, there's a genesis phase and then a real intensification phase here. Then we're sort of steady. And then there's some kind of big oscillations in the close-in radar. This is Dow from Dow 5, which was near Dow 7, but able to stay um, quite a bit longer. And so they're still able to resolve the tornado at this time, or nearly resolve it at least. And so the actual tornado strength didn't drop off but it became much smaller and really contracts toward the end. So with, with the radar farther away, um, you basically are not resolving this anymore. And so it looks as if there's just dissipation over this whole time period. So you can kind of think of that as on a bit broader scale, there's dissipation over this whole time period. But the actual tornado is, is still maintaining its strength as it's contracting. This now is um, what the dual Doppler fields look like. And so in all of these plots, the black contours are vorticity, and the white contours are W um, a bit above. And the, the W contours can look a little bit messy because it's, it's real data. So there's edges to it, and it, you know, it doesn't look perfect like it does in the model. There's gaps in it in different places from ground clutter and things. But you can get the overall idea that we have this updraft that's um, really kind of nicely um, coming around the, the rear flank downdraft and, and um, surrounding the tornado. So let me um, let it start over so you can see from the beginning. You can see the formation here and a um, you know, really nice updraft all around here. And what I want you to notice, too, is that at times we have vorticity that forms out here and then moves in and merges. Oh, I keep hitting my mouse pad too hard and switching slides. Um, vorticity out here that merges in with the tornado. Let me get to an example of that. There was an example. Um, here you can see some forming. Here's a good example. And then moving in and merging with the tornado. So this is kind of an interesting process. And another thing that we see as it starts over is um, if we look at some of this rain that's coming down around the edge here and sweeping around the tornado, um, one thing that we notice and we'll, we'll look at another, let's start over again so we can really look. But if you look at the white contours, you can see that as these come around, we get some enhancement in um, the vertical velocity along their forward edge. And, and these end up sweeping around the tornado and kind of impinging on the background vertical vorticity that's out here um, along the rear flank. I'll show you some specific examples of that where it's a little easier to see than it is in the loop. If we look at circulation at 600 meters, so this is kind of looking out at different radii and would tell us something about the average vertical vorticity within that circle, um, we can see that at the early times it, it looks 
sort of as we would expect. It's really increasing out to about a kilometer, and then it's pretty flat after that. It's very much what you'd expect from a Rankin vortex type of profile. Um, at later times, you can see that actually there's some pretty strong vorticity that's out here in the far field, and some of that is associated with these secondary vortices that are that are generated along the rear flank. So if we kind of slow this down and, and look at specific times, um, here's a nice photo from Al and, and Pam at 2211. <clears throat> and they are looking from sort of over here somewhere. Um, so what we see is, you know, at 2010, there's not really too much rain between, um, between them and the tornado. But during this time, we have one of these cores that's kind of coming around out in front of the tornado. And so that's what we see here in the reflectivity. And you notice that there's also some um, enhancement in the vorticity that goes with that. And that, at first, I, I thought, well, maybe, maybe that's similar to this DRC type of process that I think Paul already talked about, so I won't go into that in much detail, but you know, the creation of vortex rings and then their subsequent lifting. Um, but this, the time scale does seem kind of short for that. So I'm starting to wonder if there may be more of this frictionally induced um, vortex ring that's actually getting bent downward. Um, that's something that I plan to investigate as I keep looking at this case. He also notes, again, that you know, we have good updraft all along the, the front of this. Um, and if we go ahead in time, you can see that it's, it's sweeping around the tornado here. And you can see that also in the photographs here. Um, and we have this region of vorticity out here that starts to get co-located with some vertical velocity. So moving ahead another couple of minutes, so we're down in this picture here. You know, now the rain has really come um, around, so it's you know looking from from where they are, it's kind of got a lot north of the tornado, and we can see that this vorticity has increased as well um, in association with this vertical motion. Again, the vorticity is black, and the vertical motion is white. Um, that is acting to stretch it in that area. So if we try to look at this a little bit three-dimensionally, um, there's kind of a lot on this slide. So if we break it down here, um, this is this is sort of the view that I showed you before. And here we're looking from the east. So we're kind of we're looking in this way. And um, the green here is reflectivity, and purple is vertical vorticity. So we can see this big rain shaft that would be associated with this high reflectivity here. And if you kind of try to peek behind it, you can see the vertical vorticity back in here that's mostly hidden um, that's associated with the tornado. But you can also see this vertical vorticity out here that's associated with um, the part along the, the gust front up here. Down here, we're looking at it more from the southwest. We're kind of looking at the back of all of this. And so we can see the tornado here. And you can see these big cores of rain um, that are, or I should say reflectivity. I don't, I don't actually have good evidence for what's in them, although from the pictures, it certainly seems like it's rain. Um, they, these are. You can see these that will be sweeping around this um, in time. And if we go to the next time here, 22, so this is approximately the time of, of this one. Um, you know, a lot of rain all around the tornado. And you can see that some of this vorticity has started to move in closer to the tornado as it's kind of advected. Um, through here, and here we see again this this big rain shaft that would correspond to this 
blip in the reflectivity here. A lot of interesting structure in the precipitation field around this tornado. So to, to just look at kind of one process here, um, this is only the vertical vorticity. And this now we switch to the Dow 6 NOXP dual Doppler field. And we can see the we can see the vorticity out here that um, you know that we noticed was kind of strengthening and is also getting infected upward it seems um, during this time that that the rain was coming around. Um, and if we look in time, we can see it moving and eventually really being absorbed into um, into the tornado. So there's a, a merger of some of, of this vorticity that gets enhanced as these rain curtains come around and and then gets invected in and um, contributes to the tornadic circulation. Here's a, uh, a photo around 2220, which would correspond to about this time here. So the tornado was still in pretty good health at that time. And if you look back in here, you can perhaps convince yourself that there are some lowerings back there that are moving toward the tornado. So that time period, if we look at the intensity plot, corresponds kind of to from here to um, about up here. So it does seem to be associated with the, a slight increase in the intensity of the tornado. If we keep going forward in time, um, we can see that a similar thing happens later. Um, the tornado at this time, this, it's starting to get smaller. It's in that, in that um, time period where it's, it's weakening overall on, on you know, the larger scale, the circulation around it is decreasing. Um, and that is likely not tied to these little events that I'm talking about. I'm kind of looking at the small scale influences um, that cause sort of episodic changes in what's happening to the tornado. The, the larger scale circulation likely is, is more due to probably the things that, that Paul had talked about before, where there's baroclinic generation out here in the forward flank that is then um, coming in and, and contributing to the low-level mesocyclone. And that we're looking at more with ENKF um, studies, because it's very hard to really assess any of that with the observations that we have. You can see at 2226, we have a, a similar feature here with the vortex over here. Um, hopefully, these orientations aren't too hard to under, understand. This would be south to north, and this is west to east. And so um, this is where our tornado is. And we can see this another, uh, you can see this rain spiraling here and another um, intensification of vorticity out there ahead of it. This is what those times look like in the plan view. And so here is our main uh, tornado, of course. And then we have this vorticity out here that is increasing in strength over this time. And you can see that the, um, if you remember what these contours look like before, by this time, these are pretty weak contours. And almost, um, you know, this vorticity is getting almost as strong as the tornado itself is. So this is um, at that same time. And the, the purple, again, is vertical vorticity. So this is our tornado. And as the, the rain came around, let me go back to the previous slide. Um, one thing that you notice at 2226 is that unlike some of the other times, like even 2224, Ah. where um, we had rain coming around the tornado here. Uh, by 22, 26, we seem to have a lot more rain that is now in the tornado. 
And we, we can see that in the isosurfaces here, too, that some of the green reflectivity um, is, is really starting to impinge on the tornado. And if we, if we actually kind of try to tilt this view and look from below, um, we can see that the bottom of the tornado here is really getting undercut by uh, precipitation. And this, this tornado is really not going to last very much longer um, because as it's in this, this heavy precipitation that formed in the hut, it actually is going to get swept out of this area. So that begins the dissipation phase, the really strong dissipation phase, even, even with the close radar, um, we have just a, a real drop off in the intensity. So two minutes after the last slide that I showed, this is what it, um, where the tornado is relative to where the mid-level mesocyclone is. Um, and you can see that the, the new vorticity has actually hooked up with the, the pre-existing vorticity that was there. So we've kind of had a handoff, very much like in the Dowell and Bluestein um, figure from our, our old low-level mesocyclone, which if I, if I drew a different isosurface, you would see that this really kind of tilts over to here but it's gotten very sideways in between here, um, very horizontal. And this one is now becoming the new mesocyclone, which we see at 2230. By 2230, the, the original tornado has dissipated. Um, so this mesocyclone, actually, this was kind of a short-lived feature as well, um, although I haven't looked beyond this time because I was mainly interested in the tornado time itself. But um, beyond this, I think this one may last for quite some time because we, we did redeploy and we were you know, not sure if a new tornado would form. So um, I wanted to go back. This is technically not in my time period, but there is we well, would see a very rapid intensification earlier between 2208 and 2212. So I wanted to see if any of these merger type of mechanisms were going on at that time. And what we see at 2207 is um, something very similar where we have vorticity out here, um, the main tornado going on in here. And over this time period, you can see this, this vorticity getting invected in. And by 2213, which is at the end of that intensification period, um, the two have fully merged together. So whether that's a coincidence or whether this really played a role is something that I'm still working out. So. Some conclusions from this, um, one is that these wrapping rain curtains certainly do seem to perturb fields near the occlusion and are associated with enhanced vorticity there. This enhanced vorticity does appear to merge with the tornado at the, at the time of observed tornado intensification, which again is not necessarily cause and effect, but certainly something that I would like to um, explore further perhaps even with some simulations as well. Um, and although the primary source of vorticity is likely still this kind of steady flow from the forward flank, um, that at least is what we, we see in our ENKF results, um, this episodic type of vortex merger may also be associated with sudden intensification. And I mean, the final demise of the tornado appeared to result from getting undercut by by some rain and getting basically swept away from the mid-level mesocyclone in kind of a, a similar manner to the Dowell and Bluestein mechanism um, where, where there it was more uh, weak outflow winds that, that caused it to move sort of west relative to um, the, the mid-level updraft here. Um, 
it it was more because of these because of the rain that undercut it and also the winds associated with that that just sort of moved it south of um, the mid-level mesocyclone. So uh, all the pictures here are copyright of Al and, and Pam, and I'm very grateful to them for letting me use them. Um, obviously, very grateful to all of Vortex Q volunteers, um, including some that are in the crowd there, I think, um, who helped provide uh, help gather this data, and also Chris Schwartz who provide NOXP data, and um, and then people who funded this, and and lots of people I've had good discussions with regarding this work. Well, thank you, Yvette. That was that was great. Let me. Uh, I, I see we have a, a question or two for you, so I'll start with you all okay. from the floor and, and let them uh, let them hit you. Okay. Hey, Yvette, I feel like I just woke up from hibernation because I remember after Vortex 1, we all focused on the rear flank downdraft playing this key role in tornado genesis. And, and both you and Paul have, have now opened my eyes from my hibernation, I guess. And I, um, I'm very fascinated about this, about this vorticity from the forward flank. So uh, could, could, you, could you enlighten me some more and fill in the blank here? What, what happened to the rear flank downdraft? <laughs> Uh, what happened to the rear flank downdraft? Oh, well, all of this really still comes through the rear flank downdraft. Um, I mean, well, in these, the things that I'm talking about, um, these are sort of different features. Um, so, like, in through here, I didn't plot the downdraft, but in Early on, the downdraft kind of wraps all the way around here, so it's it's sort of coming in through here. So, you know, most of what uh, there may be a lot of generation of the vorticity in the forward flank, but then the parcels end up coming through the rear flank and entering the tornado um, through there. So, uh, I would not suggest that the rear flank is not. Um, not relevant or not playing a role. I think it. I think it certainly is, um, and is you know ultimately probably where where things come from. But um, but they're perhaps getting a lot of their um, vorticity and circulation up here before they come through there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you for for clarifying that for me because it's just that you didn't plot a lot of the vorticity that might be playing a role that or, or that it's coming through there. So that, that helps me a lot. I, I really felt like, well, have I just missed the last 15 years or, or something? But thanks, yeah, that clarified a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, there isn't a lot of vertical vorticity that uh, I guess at, at this, uh, you know, I've, I've plotted it everywhere on here. Um, but this is also plotted um, at, say, 700 meters. And so I believe that, or 600, I'd have to go back and look. Um, and one thing we found in our simulations is that a lot of the parcels, at least in our simulations, that, that get vorticity get it in the very lowest levels. And so observationally, I think the generation of that is pretty hard hard to see. Um, in a lot of our models, a lot happens even when they drop below the lowest scalar, which is kind of frightening, actually. But um, so it, it you know may not show up at this level, but is probably happening below that and then coming in. And then, of course, once it gets into here, and then it gets affected upward, and we can see it at this level. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. All right, wonderful. Any other questions? I think that's about it for questions so far. Um, I can't thank you again for helping helping uh, get on here at the eleventh hour. I know you had a, a rough twenty four hours trying to get out of Dallas, so thank you very much. Uh, no problem. <laughs> And uh, before we wrap up, if I can, I'll ask the same of you that I did of, of Paul, and that's uh, if I get any other questions from our other offices, because we're going to share this talk, assuming the recording came out okay, 
Um, if it's the right okay. with you, I'll, uh, I'll corral up any emails uh, from the field and parse them down, and then I'll just send them to you here in a couple of weeks once, once I get them all. And that way you don't get bombarded with a million emails. Would that be all right with you? Okay. Okay. All that right. Well, okay. Well, thanks a lot, and I'll talk with you soon.